In this video, we're going to talk about exhaust system back pressure. I recently had a student car come in with a whole host of codes, and it became a great example about the importance of considering exhaust restriction as you go through a diagnostic process. So my student brought in his car. This was a 2005 BMW 325i. He had gone through a whole bunch of different things, and this was a pretty new car to him, and so really he had inherited all of these problems. So when he first came in and we tried to look at the car, he was telling me that it had misfire, made a funny noise, did these different things. And so he had already been through a lot of the basics. He had done ignition coils and spark plugs. He had tried moving injectors around. He had replaced all of the crankcase ventilation system on that car, which is common. He replaced the disavalve, the mass airflow and intake elbows and boots, as well as the mass airflow sensor itself. My background in those E46 platforms told me that, yeah, most of that work that he did was probably warranted and was going to need to be done at some point anyway. But it didn't teach him very well about approaching a problem like this one. The codes that I saw when he first brought it in and I scanned it with him, he had a random misfire, he had misfire on cylinder 1, 2, and 3, and he had a fuel trim code just for bank 2. And so we did some tests. We did a relative compression test first just to verify that the mechanical compression or this the ability of the engine was in good shape we did some fuel trim testing we tested the oxygen sensors so we created a lean and a rich condition to see could the o2 sensors react and we did a smoke test initially the smoke test showed quite a bit of leaks and so here's one of the really bad leaks it was at one of the connections to the air oil separator that's part of the crankcase ventilation system on that engine and so we had to spend some time taking the intake manifold off fixing that leak once we got all of our intake leaks fixed and we knew that was 100% good, then we went and tested some more. Our next step was to decide exactly what's going on and what's different between bank one and bank two. The O2 sensor test that we did showed that both sensors were really reading similar numbers at idle and even with snap throttles and things like that. And so we wanted to know more. What's different on bank one and bank two? They're using the same airflow meter. The O2 sensors appear to be functioning well. And so I decided to take the PicoScope transducer and do an in-cylinder running compression test. My hope with this was to compare a cylinder on bank one and bank two and see are the events the same so that we could look at the intake, you know, the compression, the exhaust stroke, look at all those pieces and hopefully learn something. So we got set up and we did a in-cylinder running compression test on cylinder number one. And the plan was to do that and then go to cylinder five and compare our outcomes for both those. And so here on the screen, I've got the results from that cylinder one from a snap throttle. And so this is just with it running. We snap the throttle and here we see a huge problem. This line right here represents zero. This line that I've marked right here is 20 PSI. That re represents a peak of 20 PSI on the exhaust stroke. Those of us familiar with back pressure testing know that 20 PSI is a huge number. Typically when we get to 2.5 to 3.5 PSI, we begin to become concerned. And so this is a great test to show dynamically what is going on with back pressure. Previously, we might've used other tools like maybe a vacuum gauge to look at diminishing vacuum within the intake, or we might've used an exhaust pressure gauge like this. We know that some of the downfalls for these things, those of us that live in the rust belt, like we do here in Illinois, taking an O2 sensor out and putting this in, is sometimes a risky process. There's some liability there that I might pull threads out of the exhaust pipe or damage threads on the O2 sensor. And so this does take some setup. And again, there's some risk involved in damaging components. The in-cylinder test is usually much more straightforward. And we can see very clearly that I've got excessive back pressure. So the next step in this process was to verify, do we know what good looks like on this car? So this waveform here represents cylinder number five with the same snap throttle test. And you can see we've got just a really nice compression waveform here. I see my increased compression on my snap throttle and we'll see that the back pressure in the exhaust does not climb. If we put a marker here on our back pressure, we only saw about 1.2 PSI max. And so we know that this is a normal reading. And so now how do we interpret that information? What did we learn? On that six cylinder M54 engine, the fuel control is set up with two banks with cylinders one, two, and three being one bank, 
cylinders four, five, six being the other bank. The other thing is that because those banks are separate, they each get their own catalyst. And so the catalyst is built into the exhaust manifold. And so this result told us pretty quickly that that catalyst on the front bank, bank one, must have a restriction or be clogged partially. And partially because it really didn't show symptoms at idle, but when put under load, like when we had it on our dyno, it was clear that the engine had an inability to breathe. So we had to send the student away with, you need a exhaust manifold and catalyst replaced, and we'll look toward the future, hopefully he gets that fixed, and it solves most of his problems. Another great part of this process was to show the student kind of this other avenue of diagnostics, using some of the new equipment we have to simplify the process, and then also getting to talk through the list of codes that he had and kind of how they related, right? So the cylinder one, two, and three misfires correlate with a restriction in just that bank. And so when those cylinders were unable to breathe, that air, the stale exhaust air stayed in the combustion chamber and created a misfire. But then the other interesting thing is that we had a fuel trim code on bank two. And so the theory there is that the exhaust gases are backing into the intake manifold and then causing that inert gas is causing fuel trim issues on the other bank as it gets pulled into those cylinders. And so it was a great discussion with the student to try to get him to wrap his mind around how do these codes correlate? How do they come together? And what's really the root cause? I think that troubleshooting and critical thinking is one of the best skills that we can develop in our students, especially when we look at trouble codes and look at faults that might have multiple layers to them. So that's my walkthrough and kind of a case study on this BMW about how the PicoScope transducer really helped to shed some light and give us better insight into what the root cause was on this BMW. I hope this video is helpful and gives you some ideas about how to utilize that tool and get more familiar with it.